This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. Welcome back into another episode of the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers, and a winning episode, a winning road episode to break down for you. Alongside Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cooty, and we talked about it last week, how big the, the game was, and finding a way to win on the road, and you got to call it. That was... That's the way a, a plane ride is supposed to feel like coming coming back from the road, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, besides getting home at 3 a.m. and eating ice cream at midnight, yeah, for sure. That's the way it's supposed to feel. And you and I talked about it. you're walking into a four-game stretch that Nebraska is going to be have a chance to go, in my opinion, 3-1 and one, if not 4-0. and oh. But if you start that stretch off with a loss, it makes it so hard. You know, you go into bye week – feeling really down about yourself really down about what you had as a team and I know people are going to say well you know it wasn't this good of a win or this that or the other thing or you can say whatever you want but to go on the road and win a football game in the Big Ten is hard yeah I don't care who you're playing it's a hard thing to do the Big Ten is a fantastic conference and for us to go in there and handle business the way we did and we'll talk a ton about the black shirts and how important they were but I was just proud of this team that they found a way to win and didn't find a way to lose. Yeah. You know, I feel like we get on here time and time again, like, man, we had it. It was right there. And then we just let it slip. And as much as our offense tried to let it slip at times, this team rallied together. They fought. They embodied their head coach's message that they gave to him all week. And they found a way to come out on the road with a W. Also, my first W, my first road W is part of the broadcast network. Nice. So that's always a good time as well. You know, that's my thing, too, is like, you know, people can nitpick it all they want. But how many times did Nebraska in the last – three seasons not find a win to win on the road so pretty or not they're walking out of there with a win that has not happened very often in the last three seasons yeah it's not something we're used to and we talk about this team needing to find a way to learn how to win well this is the first step learning how to win a tough a tough game on the road I wouldn't call it a hostile environment by any means but you still Friday night short week coming off getting your teeth kicked in against Michigan fought battled, played physical, played tough, and didn't blink in the eye of adversity when so many times we've seen this team crumble in the eye of adversity in the fourth quarter. And yes, was it what Coach Rule wears it needs to be, where Satterfield and White want it to be? No, we're leaps and bounds from there. But I think this is a great first step looking forward to that because you can give credit to Nebraska, but Illinois was in the exact same situation. They came off a bad loss to Purdue. They were looking of how can I get things right? How can I right the ship? How can I get back on track? And they didn't take advantage of the opportunities that were given to them. We took advantage of the opportunities that were given to us. And let's hope this is a turning point and a pivotal point where bull hopes are kept alive and we can just keep marching forward here. All right, let's start at the beginning. The goal line stand and, and give it to me in, from the perspective of an offensive lineman on the other side of the football, because I mean, obviously we can talk about the momentum swing and I could tell you what the sideline was like for Nebraska. But when you are able to do that as a defense, what is the feeling for an opposing offense when you cannot get it in on four downs on fourth and goal? Demoralization. I mean, pure and utter demoralization. When you march right down the field on the opening drive, you're feeling yourself, you're feeling good. You get first and goal, and you get four chances at that, and you get stood up at the goal line each and every single time. It sucks the air, and it sucks the life right out of the entire team. And you as an O-lineman feel that because it is your fault. Because it is. You, you should score on your man. That is the coaching point when you're on a goal line or you're on short yardage. Get the first down with your man. Get score with your man. The back will ride right behind you. And watching it back and watching the tape, great push up the middle by Nash, just creating a pile, not allowing the back to be able to hit it full steam. He had to take a cut in the backfield. And Bullock and Reimer, not Reimer, Bullock and Henrich and Chief Boards, those guys coming flying like missiles over the top. I mean, like complete missiles meeting that running back on their line of scrimmage. And as an offensive lineman, you come off on the sideline and everyone's looking at you like, really? really? You couldn't push them half an inch? I mean, that ball, Jessica, I was looking at through the binocs and up in the booth. I was like, that thing's touching the white. Like, you could have just fallen forward. I mean, they had to reset the clock because the center, like, moved it half an inch forward and it was over the goal line. <laughs> like, it was so close and they just couldn't do it. And as much as I hate saying that won us the football game, I think with them losing all that confidence and losing all that moxie there and the Huskers gaining everything from there and going down and scoring three points off of that, 
the game, in my opinion, was starting to fall out of hand for Illinois right after that goal line stand. And, and so now take me through if you're the, uh, that's your team, your teammates that just did that. And you're the offense sitting over there on the sideline thinking, okay, we're about to, you know, be down seven, nothing. And then you see your defense rise to the occasion. How does that light a fire under you before you take the field for the first time? Yeah, it goes into complimentary football. You want to play hard for your brothers across the ball. All three phases want to play well, but you know that you are given a gift. I mean, when you stop a team on a fourth down as an offense, you're given a gift, and you want to go respond and take advantage of that gift. Is It's essentially, in a shape or form, a turnover, right? They had at least three points on the board, and now it was gone to zero. So flipping the field is the first thing you think about when you get there, and you think, got to get the first first down. Right, got to give my punter some room that if we have to punt, he's not punting from 10 yards away. So the idea is to get the first first down. We do the quarterback sneak, give ourselves some breathing room. And I love the play play call by Satterfield of going max protect, send them deep. You know, those safeties have their eyes. Those corners kind of have their eyes in the backfield thinking it's a run, trying to get up there and run support. And Marcus Washington does a great job just running by the corner, finding the whole shot between the safety and the corner. And Harburg delivers a very beautiful ball. And from there on, the route was on. Well, uh, 21 rushing yards total for the game for Illinois. The fifth time in six games that they've held an opponent to 60, under 60 rushing yards. Um, what what were you seeing out of the black shirts in the way that they did respond? They responded in a big way, but but what was allowing them to have so much success against specifically Illinois on, on Friday night? You know, the big thing, obviously, they were missing a couple starting running backs, which hurts, and then Love ends up getting hurt there, and so they had only the true freshman Fagan back there running the ball, who's an enormous human. But I thought Tony White's plan to contain Altmaier was very good. You know, Altmaier, their quarterback, was their leading rusher going into the football game, and you saw different ways that Tony White was trying to contain him to not let him get out of the pocket or get out of the zone read scheme, whether it was Prince Well and a spy, MJ Sherman, and Chief Borders at times were kind of on the edges, making sure he didn't escape, and then really you got to give a lot of credit to Nash Hutmaker, Ty Robinson, Elijah Judy, Cam Lenhart, all those guys that rotated in there, uh, Van Poppel, of just not allowing these – offensive linemen to get up on our linebackers and allow them to play fast physical trust their eyes and shoot their gun downhill so I thought the defensive scheme was great and they played within the scheme which really turned them into a one-dimensional team they had to throw the ball and that's not what Illinois wants to do they don't want to be a passing team they want to be a run first team as every Brett Bielma team has ever been so hats off to Tony White and that defense and really just hats off to I'm gonna I'm just gonna say it hats off to the Nebraska boys I mean Gifford Bullock and uh, you know, Grant Hagee making plays and the Nebraska boys showed up to play some of those guys that were walk-ons and just heartbeats of the program they all showed up in a big way and made huge plays for this defense and this team you know you, you talk a lot about this and, and you said this before about um, you know even when you were on the call at Colorado and at times when you need players to make big plays Sometimes Nebraska was lacking in that, but I think you can point to the defense. Now I, I do, I know that there's stuff to work on the offense and this coaching staff and players will be the first to tell you that, but I think you can point to the defense and say, Hey, when, when plays needed to be made, they did that. What, what you've been asking to do some of these guys to do in those big moments, step up and make a play. I mean, this was really a good example of that. I feel like. And they didn't press. Like we talked about last week, what happened against Michigan of them trying to go outside the system to make that play, to go rogue a little bit. Everyone played very assignment football. You know, I didn't see any from the naked eye missed assignments, blown coverages, guys out of their gaps, right? Sometimes they had a made, they'd make a play offenses are going to, but the big plays came to them because they trusted Tony White's play calling. They trusted the system. They trusted that he's going to scheme me open. And then I got to take advantage of that opportunity when I'm going to get a free rush, or I'm going to get a single rush, or I'm going to get a rush on the back, right? And I'm going to take advantage of those and execute those. But they did it all within the system and the big plays came because they played really well on first and second down and they were able to get them in third and longs and third and manageables for the defense to dial up those pressures and let Tony White's scheme come to play. So really proud of those guys for taking the coaching points, right? That's a big thing I wanted to mention too. 
last week you heard rule and you heard all the coaches talk about man we didn't play within our system and guys didn't do their assignments everyone trusted that and that's a great growth measure of a team of can you take the coaching from a big loss and then implement it during the week and then have that roll over to the next game so that's a big growth of the program step for me too as i'm watching this nebraska rebuild those are the kind of things that i want to see as we start to move forward under the rule regime valentino's a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else what started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska, has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years. All right, let's flip things over to the offensive side, and let's start with the guys up front. You had to be pretty pleased because, I mean, there were times at the end, and you, you've mentioned this several times about when, you're exu- when you are um, really – exuding your will on someone at the end of a football game and, and the physicality. And you were talking about Nuri finishing guys off and, and Ben Scott. You had to love the way that the physicality was still there and, and very evident even at the end of the football game. Yeah, you know, imposing your will is the best way to win a football game and to win it on the ground and to have the ability to rush the football over and over and over again and be effective in your rushing really was really good until the final three drives. Right. Everything was really good. The final three drives and we'll get to it. But overall, I thought that we found more of an identity in the run game, more downhill, more of that zone read, kind of pushing things more vertically instead of trying to stretch things out. And then I love that that was our identity. We did it, did it, did it. And then the wrinkle was kind of the little gadget flip to Billy Kemp coming around the edge or someone else to stretch the edge, just enough to keep them honest. But hats off to Corcoran and Nuri and Piper and Ben Scott and Bryce Benhart and Fedoni and Bullock, too. They're involved in the blocking schemes. I felt like they had probably their best game rushing the football against a Big Ten opponent, right? They did against La Tech. Excuse me. They were able to do it against the NIU. But to do it against a Big Ten opponent is confidence for those guys. And we saw them working the way that Rayola and Satterfield and talked about how we'd seen them working throughout the, the training camp through spring ball. So really excited for the way they got to do it. We just need to make sure that we finish with the ball in our hands. You know, if we have a chance to ice the game and a chance to finish the game and, and turn it over, then we really want to make sure that we ice it with the ice that game, ball in our hands effective rushing the football and holding on to the football. So, uh, you know, I know the one turnover with uh, Emmett Johnson and, and Heinrich Harburg, maybe some miscommunication there. And Emmett, you're asking him to be in a role that he hasn't been in before. And that was when Anthony Grant was um, injured on the sideline, getting, I think, retaped, working through, getting worked on a little bit. So, but I, I think he's a young guy. We saw some flashes from him too. He had some pretty decent runs. He'll learn from that. But that one turnover, I think, was not on anything other than maybe a lack of experience with a quarterback and a running back. Yeah, and I mentioned it on the call too. You know, that was a big eye set, right? Had the fullback in there, the running back in there. And historically, that's been Grant's running set, right? He's more of the power back, the downhill, hit it in the gap type of running back. And where Emmett was more of the out of the shotgun, the kind of the jitterbug, get up, make a guy miss. And he showed some really good elusiveness, I thought, with being able to get through the line of scrimmage and making the linebackers miss. And so you put... Emmett out there now and you're like hey you're now the big power back not sure how many of those reps he's taken in practice right you talk about he was not really in the rotation for the first three four weeks because we had Ramir and we had Gabe and we had Grant and then we had Emmett right so now he gets thrust in there how many true handoffs has he taken from Harburg in that in that moment right how many times at that mesh point have they collided and as most people that need played the game knows when you get in the game everything speeds up Right. You might have taken some of those in quarterback center exchange, pre-snap, pre-practice, I mean, and post-practice, but even in practice. But that was in my I think that was the first time in the game he had taken a under center turnaround true handoff fashion. And it was just a it just a bad mesh point between him and Harburg. And you're right. He'll learn from that. He'll understand that. And, you know, any good player is going to continue to just keep repping that and repping that and repping that because we're going to need him down the stretch. He was a really nice bright spot for us in the second half. So what were the issues then, do you think, in, in the final three drives and some of those drives that you, you really would like to capitalize? I think what the points off turnovers was only three. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the uh, what did you feel like watching from, you know, the, the box that was the were the issues there with the offense? Yeah, you know, when we get down into the the red zone or even the high red, you know, we had three three opportunities in our own plus 35 
to go in and score and score points. And when you get into that area, the field kind of starts to condense and starts to shrink a little bit on you because you can't run those big developing routes and get those safeties out of there because the field's just short. And we need to be better at finding our opportunities down there with our tight ends, finding the short passing game. You know, right now we don't have a lot of guys that are getting open quickly underneath. You know, so that's where you look to guys like Thomas Fedoni and Billy Kemp to win their one-on-one -on -one matchups. And then Harburg's got to trust himself to make those tight window throws. Inside the red zone, everything's tight and really small margin for error. And I think he's still just finding his confidence to, man, that's between the safety and the linebacker. I have to anticipate him getting open and just put the ball right there and trust him. So got to see some more of that. Also just got to make sure that we're better on first down in our red area. I thought overall throughout the day we were pretty good on first down. But as we get closer to the goal line, we want to have the whole playbook open and accessible to us. But if you're in second and 10 on your own 35, yeah. you're now questioning, do I, as a play caller, well, do I run to make sure we're still in field goal range? Do I pass and risk us being in a long field goal, right? Just giving the play caller more confidence to go down there. Okay, it's second and four. We're in field goal range. Let's take a shot at the end zone here and then know we can convert on third down. So just being better on first down as we cross over into that high red area. All right, quarterback Heinrich Harburg is going to make it. He's making it real tough to take the ball out of his hands, isn't he? You and I both talked about it last week about how this is Sims' team, and I, I texted you this week, and I was like, I think I have to change my tune. Like, I think you have a quarterback that goes on the road and wins on the road. It's going to be really hard as a coach and as an offensive staff to go, Jeff Sims, you're back in. And I know I've said you never lose your your never lose your spot to injury, but. I don't think you can just straight up bench Harburg now. I think you can work Sims back in and you can give him some packages to get him ramped back up to speed. But this offense is starting to click a little bit. And the last thing you want to do as a staff going into your bye week is shuffle everything up when you start to feel like you got a little bit of momentum, right? Change, no one likes change. There's not a single person on earth that's like, I love change, change everything, right? Like no one loves that. So I think you want to continue with what you've got going here and basically let Sims and Harburg battle it out throughout this week, and then you're going to have to make a decision of who gives us the best opportunity to win based off what we've seen throughout practice and what we've seen through the first half of the season here. And if that's me, then I really do think that that has to be Harburg. You know, it just um, the way – you know, the two, there was two fumbles. Though. The one interception, you basically were like, it's basically like a, a punt. But, yeah. you know, just you, you feel like he's getting more and more confidence. The offense is getting better. I know that, you know, people want to nitpick that they didn't score and they didn't score in the red zone. But you cannot deny, and, and I brought this up to Greg last night on Sports Nightly, that there were some improvements and there have been improvements in the offense that we saw on – Friday night, the the long drives, being able to get some other things going and, and not just being one-dimensional. We saw some things through the air. Then we also saw them getting back to the ground game. It just to me, I, I don't think it, even though the points didn't show it necessarily, but there were some good things that were taking place with Heiner Carberg as the quarterback with that offense. For sure. Yeah, anytime you have improvement, you know, moving the football, getting first downs, extending drives, controlling some of the time of possession – it shows just improvement as a whole, but I think that's more of a, a whole team thing instead of just the quarterback. You know, how many times did Bullock and Ty Hahn make huge third down plays that extended drives? And that's just Harbor going through his progressions, going through his read and finding the open guy. And like you talked about early in the show, guys stepping up and making plays. And that's been something that's lacking. And now with Marcus Washington being out with the ACL, you're going to talk about a position room now that's really thin. And you saw Malachi Coleman and you saw Dawes come in there as freshmen that are going to have to contribute now that at the beginning of the year, you're hoping to redshirt them, develop them when, and figure it out as we go. But with the positions that that with that position group being dinged up as much as it is we're going to have to see some more of those young receivers going out there stepping up making plays and it's also going to fall on guys like billy kemp and fedoni to really start elevating their game even more than they already have in the last few weeks because we're going to need help on the passing game when you already have a young quarterback who isn't as polished as a passer as you'd like him to be still working on his throwing motion you know comes out kind of low and and hard um you know we got some deflect passes but we're going to need some steps up in those. But Harburg is trusting his go-to guys of Bullock and Ty Han, who he was working with in the second group, all of training camp, because now they're with the starters. And you're starting to see some of that chemistry built between those guys that allowed us to convert third downs and keep drives alive.
Well, Jeremiah just mentioned it. I was going to try to save the bad news for last, but as Coach Rule mentioned on his press conference, Marcus Washington, torn ACL out for the year, and, and that one hurts. That one hurts, Rule. And, and we've made no bones about it on this podcast. Jeremiah jokes all the time. He's not a fan of defensive backs or wide receivers, but your two favorite guys, defensive back and now wide receiver, uh, hopefully Deshaun Singleton will be back. But now Marcus Washington, you've been a huge fan of him. He's not afraid to block, and he does the dirty work. A lot of times it doesn't show up in the stat sheet. So you're talking about not even just like being a guy that – obviously Heinrich Harburg trusts throwing the ball to and can make big catches, but also the other things that he does that doesn't always show up on the stat sheet. That, that's a big, big loss for this offense. Yeah, and he's one of the emotional and leaders of that offense as well. You know, you see him on the sideline. You mentioned it many a times uh, to us up in the booth. He was still after hurt, helping guys along, putting his arms around guys, helping coach them along, and that's more of the role he's going to get thrust into. But when you lose a guy like that on the edge, it really hurts your passing attack. He was our stretch guy. He was our most dynamic receiver. He was our number one receiver. And when you lose that guy, it doesn't just happen overnight where someone else just takes over as the number one. It needs to become a wide receiver by committee thing, and everyone's going to have to take their turn being the guy. And losing him in the blocking game and everything is a huge blow to this offense. But as it always is said, next man up, move it up 10, whatever it has to be. That is just the nature of football. It's a 100% injury rate sport. And you just hate to see a guy coming back off of a strong year last year was going to be the guy after Palmer leaves, uh, get his season cut short. All right, so who would you give your game balls to? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, th th there's so many. I think on defense, I have to give it to John Bullock. He played fantastic, arguably his best game as a Husker, in my opinion, both in coverage and in the run support and in blitzing. And just all around fantastic football game by him and his ability to just be all over the field. And then on offense, you know, I want to give it to Harbert because he won a road game as a starting quarterback. And that's a really hard thing to do. And that's his first road win. That's something he will never forget, his ability to go out there, operate the offense well. Obviously, some things he's going to want back get cleaned up and worked on. But to have a guy like that step up when your starting quarterback goes down, lead a couple home wins, and, and then respond really, really well to getting adversely after the game against Michigan and come out and win a game, got to give the game ball to Henrik Hardberg. What's the difference between going into a bye week, coming off a win or coming off a loss? The world of difference. I mean, you can't even start to think of the emotions that coming off a bye win, you can just kind of take a breath. Right? Like, okay, let's regroup. Let's take a second. Let's self-scout. Let's go back, correct the tape. Happy corrections because we won versus you go into a bye week and after a huge a loss like that, especially if we would have lost in after leading most of that game and controlling most of that game, you start to question everything. You start to sit at home and stare at the ceiling fan as it makes its 12,000th rotation and going, what do I have to do to change to help us win these games? Or what is going on? Are we good enough? Can we do this? What's happening? Right? The questions just start to swirl inside your own mind. And that happens on everyone on the team, including the coaches. And so it can start to be a little bit of a panic because you chew on it for two weeks. Right? You chew on it. You just sit there and think and think. And you don't have another game to game plan for and get that thought out of your brain and all of that. So going in with a win allows you to really reset physically, mentally, emotionally, and be ready to go for the last half push of the season. So what do you think will be the big things that this coaching staff look to address over these uh, couple of weeks? Yeah, I think number one is trying to get our young receivers going and getting them really ingrained, right? Malachi Coleman, Doss, and getting those guys back and making sure, hey, you're going to be in the game plan now, right? Lloyd, hey, we need you to be locked in, dialed in. Let's get a jump start here on Northwestern and start to really get you ingrained in this playbook so you can understand things, so you can be a difference maker, not just a body out there for us on the receiving end. And then on the defensive end, I think it's just continuing to find out what we do well and then just continuing to get better at it. Right, defensively for me is not as much about installing new things as much as perfecting the stuff that we're really good at. If there's some blitzes that we've gotten home on a lot, how do we get to those blitzes in more of a disguise? Right, how do we disguise that blitz a little bit more so the teams can't figure it out? Or hey, if we want to get to this front or that front, or how do we want to start adding some stuff into our playbook, into our repertoire that isn't completely installing new things? It's just adding slight wrinkles to the stuff that we're already really good at so we can keep offenses on their toes and we can't let them get a tendency on us. You know, that's what I want to see from the defense. And then overall, just continuing the unforced and un, uh, unforced errors, the substitution errors, 
the jumping off sides, the having to take timeouts because we don't have the right personnel in the huddle, or whatever it is, that stuff's got to get cleaned up, and that'll be a point of emphasis on the bye week as well because that's just a lack of communication, whether it be from the box to the coaches, coaches to players, right? That has to be more mainstream, more mainlined so that we don't have to burn timeouts where we're going to want them at the end of the game for something that's going to turn into a five-yard penalty. All right, we do this uh, every year and really only get one chance at it. Who's your midseason MVP? We're, we're six games in, six games to go. Who's your midseason MVP for the offense and the defense? Offense is hard because we've rotated so many bodies. I know. There yeah. like hasn't been a clear guy from day one to Well, and then people have gotten five. hurt and exited. Yeah, I mean, got, Ben Scott, I'm surprised you didn't go with Ben Scott. I mean, he's up there for me. He's been so consistent. And, you know, the guy for me, he's MVP slash most improved is probably Bryce Benhart. Mm, yeah. You know, he's a guy that we haven't heard a lot of his name called, which is a good thing when you're an offensive lineman. When people aren't talking about, oh, what's Bryce Benhart doing or what's this like? That's a good thing. It means you're doing your job, right? So I think I'm going to give it to Bryce Benhart. He, he took the challenge of being called into action last year saying we need more out of you. Rayola sp uh, spoke about how he's a leader of that team. So for me, it's going to be Bryce Benhart as he started to kind of come into his own as that starting right tackle on offense. And then on defense, it's going to be Nash Hutmaker. He's our best defensive player, and it shows up on tape time and time again as you're watching him. He's disruptive. He's strong. He's making a difference in the passing game as a rush, as a rush nose guard. He's getting pressure, whether it's looping or he's running TE stunts and allowing a guy to come free up the middle. You know, he's playing his role extremely well in this Tony White 3-3 scheme, and so Nash Hutmaker is going to be my MVP for the defense. Two, three years ago, would you have ever thought you would have said Nash Hopmaker was our best defensive player? <laughs> no, you couldn't, you couldn't have paid me a million dollars and told me that was going to be true. But that just goes to the character of the kind of kid he is yeah. and how hard he works and the respect that he has. I mean, he wears number zero for a reason, right? He got voted by one of his teammates, all of his teammates, of one of the hardest working, most reliable, accountable type of guys. And so it doesn't surprise me that he's playing at this level based off of what everyone has said about him to be true. Now, he just needs to keep doing it, keep improving. I think if he continues to work and develop his craft and perfect some more technique stuff, he has a chance to be an NFL player in a few years. And when you have a young player that you can look at that and say NFL potential, that just means he's going to continue to help you win games in college. I think it's such a great story because he was a could have been a national champion wrestler probably four time. And I asked him in his corner conversation a few weeks ago, why didn't you do wrestling? He's like, I just I thought I had a higher ceiling in football and didn't really know what that ceiling was, but thought there was, you know, I, I yeah, I could have d done wrestling, but I thought I could maybe potentially really grow into something special for football. And, he, and he's had to put in the work. And so to me, that's a great story of hey he comes in it took some time but if you stick with it and you trust your training and you and you do the work and you do things right look at where you can be yeah he's a perfect example of develop find a way to de keep developing keep getting better and then when you get your opportunity you make the most of it that's how college football used to be you come in you develop for a few years and then you got your opportunity and we're seeing so many young guys have to play so early all across college football they're losing some of that development piece early on in their career nash is the per perfect example of he wasn't quite ready when he got here that's okay that's fine worked his tail off in the weight room worked his tail off on the practice field and earned a chance to go out there and be a difference maker. And when he went out there, he wasn't just contributing, he was disrupting. And that's what you need from your defensive lineman. So really proud of the polar bear and what he's been able to accomplish. And one of these days I'm going to ask him to take me up pheasant hunting in South Dakota because <laughs> that's, that's bird Mecca up there. Big uh, plans for the bye week I'm actually heading to Cincinnati, um, Cincinnati to watch Cordell Volson, my client, play against the Seattle Seahawks. So really excited to get up. It'll be my first NFL game that I got to go to this year. I was supposed to go to the Monday night football game against the Giants, uh, Giants Jets at the beginning of the year. Got rained out, which God was probably doing me a favor considering the score of that game <laughs> and the rain that was there. So I'm excited to go get my see my guys play. It's the, one of the best parts of my job is to go see your clients doing their thing. So really excited to get up to Cincinnati and watch the Bengals play. How about Cam Taylor Britt? Pick six yeah. last week. That uh, the Bengals team, hopefully that gets them back on track because they're too good to be this bad. They they just are. They're just they're just too good to be this bad. They got too much talent across the board. And Cam Taylor Britt's coming into his own as being a, a top twenty corner in this league. So really happy for him. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Sideline Slice. We'll be back next week to dive into Northwestern and preview that. We normally do both, but since we've got a bye week, we will just uh we'll just talk about the win 
on mm. today's episode. And we'll, and we'll do the more of the preview coming up next week. So appreciate your time, safe travels, and we'll look forward to doing it again next week. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. And as always, the Sideline Slice brought to you by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Go Big Red.